Today's episode is sponsored by Darmok Designs, helping clients revolutionize their production and sales capabilities, resulting in more efficiency, more output, and ultimately more revenue. Aerospace and defense manufacturing. Machines and automation. Additive manufacturing. Smart manufacturing. The global manufacturing economy. Welcome to Advanced Manufacturing Now, the podcast for manufacturing professionals, powered by SME. From the design screen to the shop floor to final assembly, we drive the conversation about making manufacturing smarter by connecting people who are passionate about manufacturing. Hello, and welcome to Advanced Manufacturing Now, the podcast for manufacturing professionals. I'm your host, Steve Plum, Editor-in-Chief for SME Media. I'm joined today by Grace and Tom McCubbin of Darmok Designs. They launched the company just recently, about a year ago, not even, to help small and mid-sized uh, manufacturers. Grace is the CEO and Tom is the head designer. They both have extensive experience, Grace mainly on the sales side and Tom on the in engineering side. Welcome to the show, uh, both of you. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. Great. Well, before we get started, I was wondering if you could uh, share a little bit more information about your experience and how you uh, when about starting Darmok? Yeah, that would be awesome. So um, as you mentioned, I am Grace. I am the CEO and uh, I have a, a background in professional sales. And uh, my when my husband had these engineering ideas, I figured if I could be successful selling other people's products, I could certainly be successful selling my own. And so we decided to partner up and see if we could advance this. Yeah, and so I've I've been uh, working in the engineer or manufacturing field for a little over twenty years now. You know, we've made all kinds of parts for all kinds of companies over the years, and uh, we're always looking for better ways to remove operator intervention time. So the the less time that a operator has, a machine operator has to spend with a single part, the more time that they have to do other stuff. And so, uh, kind of through that process over the years. We have refined a lot of strategies that come in really handy for that. We also had uh, another project where a customer wanted us to uh, quote this one part, and we simply didn't have the uh, the machine overhead to do it. They wanted, uh, you know, we we had been doing about two thousand of these parts for them a month, and suddenly they needed ten to twelve thousand a month, and scaling uh, the way that we were doing it just wasn't feasible. So we ended up purchasing a new machine and completely changing the process to where we were doing everything on. Well, really, I think what was the inspiration here was that we wanted to run the machines or run this project on a on a Swiss lathe, but they didn't make tooling and fixturing for the like they didn't make the tooling and fixturing that would be required for us to complete the project. And when we came up against that, uh, Tom decided to just make his own, and it was so successful that the idea uh, for Darmok Designs was born because uh, we originally did this for his previous employer, and once word started getting around that we had this capability, that's that's where we launched. So what types of uh, companies or customers are, are you targeting as far as uh, size and applications? And you mentioned you know, the Swiss uh, Blaze. Uh, uh, what types of... Uh... Uh, equipment are you looking at uh, primarily? Um, well, as far as customers go, like anybody right now, we uh, do a lot of work in the firearms industry, um, as well as like a few other smaller customers. But yeah, a lot of firearms and just any any industry that's utilizing any small metal components, it, particularly if they're outsourcing them, because the that's something that. That's kind of our claim to fame that we hang our hat on is we're often able to produce American-made milled metal components that are competitive with overseas prices. Because what's happening in manufacturing in America is a lot of these really small components, even OEM manufacturers, they don't make them in-house because they require too many touches from an operator. They don't have high enough mar margin, and so they're ordering them, and we're finding uh, gaps in the supply chain, bottlenecks in the supply chain that are leading to 
uh, suppliers not being able to fulfill orders because they can't get these components because they're having to import them. And so we've been able to work out these processes that allow us to offer American-made components for uh, prices competitive, sometimes with overseas vendors. And we are also able to offer those services to other manufacturers. So not only can we make the parts for you, if you'd rather make them yourself, we're happy to come in and build tooling and fixturing for your machine and show you how to do that. You mentioned a, a couple of big trends in the, the industry, you know, especially since uh, COVID. One is what's going on in the supply chain and the need to expedite that that process. And the other is, is reshoring back to uh, the United States. How is that trend, uh, these trends, uh, affecting your business and your and what you offer to potential customers? Yeah, I think that there is definitely a, a huge amount of interest from manufacturers in, you know, buying their parts here in America. And I think that there's huge interest in the idea of being able to cost effectively bring uh, some of those components back in-house. Uh, so I think that the trends in the industry are a, a perfect fit for where we're at. And it was actually part of what motivated us to start out on our own was because the response that we've gotten just from the local manufacturers that we initially began our business with has shown us that there is a huge market for this. There's a huge need for this. And there are so many manufacturers who are maybe not making the margin they need to be. Maybe their business is suffering and on the verge of not being able to continue if they don't make a significant change, but they don't have the capital, a company like ours is exactly the solution because we can provide an affordable response. You talked to earlier about uh, helping companies improve their efficiency, which is, of course, what uh, all manufacturers hope to do. Sometimes that's easier said or thought uh, of to be actually accomplished. What are some of the specific things that uh, you're hoping to achieve with Dharmic in, in terms of improving efficiency? How, how do you go about doing that? Well, one of the ways that we've helped a customer improve efficiency uh, is actually doing their parts for them. So they had one uh, a process that they were doing where they had a uh, just a regular two-axis bar-fed lathe, and they would... Uh, kind of cut apart and part it off. And then from there, it would go to a uh, just a regular three-axis mill, and it would go through another operation. And they they were doing quite a lot of these. It was like 10,000 of four different SKUs of these a year. And so uh, they had just a machine operator running both uh, both machines. And, you know, it worked for them, but they were looking for a way to uh, kind of increase their the amount of business they could do, but they were kind of at the limit of how many machines they could fit in their shop. And so by well, having us do the parts for them, we were actually able to produce them and sell them to them for what their cost already was in the part. So they kept the same margin uh, and they basically freed up two machines and an operator to do other stuff to uh, you know increase the amount of business that they're able to do. Right. So definitely you're able to help them out by having them outsource uh, the work to you. But I know another big part of your operation is working to help automate some of the, the processes, which is you know, another big trend, obviously. And, and some uh, smaller manufacturers don't have the wherewithal that uh, larger companies do. So you know, how do you go about helping them in, in this capacity? Well, there's... Uh definitely less expensive ways to get more from your machines. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can approach your fixturing to uh, maybe just increase the amount of parts that you have on your table at a time so that you can increase so you can increase the un unattended time. Uh, and so we can come in and help design that. Uh, we can also design tooling uh, that can help reduce the number of steps uh, or a number of operations required to make a, a certain part. Like we had uh, one recently that it was uh, it's three operations typically to make this part, but by doing some custom uh, tooling designs, uh, we were able to reduce that to two operations, so that's less operator touches. And it reduced the cycle time by 13%. That too. 
That that's pretty impressive. <laughs> I know you, you've uh, just really getting started uh, up and running, but it sounds like you've already had some good um, success stories. Any other applications that come to mind that uh, that stand out? Um, we had a customer making a product on Swiss machines uh, that they were running. It was a 14-minute cycle time, um, and they hired us to improve that, uh, and we were able to reduce it to, I want to say it was 11 minutes and 53 seconds per cycle, uh, while also reducing the... Uh, the amount of operator interventions because they were having a couple tools that uh, chips would build up on and you'd just have to stop the machine every now and then and clear the chips and let it go again. But uh, now they're not only getting significantly improved cycle times for it on the machines uh, and equipment they already have, but they are also uh, able to run it in between shifts as well. So do you go out and, and benchmark their operations? Uh, you know, what's what's the process like in terms of you know once a, a customer comes to you with with a need and how do you go about addressing that? It can depend on the customer. Some of them uh, keep really good like data uh, on terms in terms of what they're doing already, and uh, being able to bring that to me kind of helps me hit the ground faster. Otherwise, I can come out and just kind of see what's going on uh, and kind of get a feel for it myself. And really, the, the process is really that evaluation piece. When somebody comes uh, to us with a project, our first steps are going to be to to go in and take a look at that. And as Tom pointed out, you know, some shops have better data collection than others. Um, but regardless, we're always going to take the step of going out there, putting eyes on the project. We like to embed ourselves in the company because a lot of times it's not just the machine program. There's often behaviors of employees uh, and shop processes that affect this too. So um, in our process, we go in the shop and we usually perform the programming and we do the machine setups right there in the shop with their staff. And in that process, not only are we improving machine time, but we've also helped clients simply moving the areas where they're storing some of their materials. It was causing bottlenecks. They didn't even realize it because no one had ever taken note uh, we had another client that saved some uh, time and energy by uh, switching up one of their suppliers because they didn't realize that there was another option to get something that they were constantly waiting on. We try to take a holistic view of everything that's happening to this component from the moment that you're getting the PO from your client to the moment you're sending the finished part out the door. And we're trying to streamline that process as much as we can. And I know Tom... It sounds like you are a little bit of an inventor, or I'd like to to play around with things. A mad scientist. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what role does customization uh, play in, the, in your process, and how open are customers to letting you find new ways uh, of doing something? Oh, they, the, my customers love when I show them a new way to do something. I, I think it's a... Uh something universally sought after if they're, you know, talking to us in the first place. Oh, I agree. I, I think the biggest challenge, like the barrier that we have is that kind of like stuck in the box thinking from places that just kind of assume that they know the capabilities of their equipment and don't really believe that we have anything to offer. Um, I think those are the biggest barriers. And I think that one of the unique arenas for us is that Tom's, you know, lack of formal training on the Swiss lathes and some of the other equipment has allowed him to imagine possibilities. So when other people were telling us, no, you can't make that on a Swiss lathe, when we were trying to find tooling and parts for the project we were trying to do, we didn't see that as a barrier. It was like, oh, they don't make it? Well, we'll make it. Um, and so I think that there's definitely a need for some, you know, open-mindedness on the part of manufacturers to understand that there's possibilities out there. So was it just that that was never had been attempted be before and you, you looked at different ways to, to do it on a, on a swift lathe? Uh, I wouldn't say not all of it's never been attempted before. It's just not done normally. Yeah. It's, like, it's not when easily there's standard. There's a lot of parts that I make on uh, Swiss and mill turn lathes that people 
would never look at that and say that's a lathe part yeah like we've gone into manufacturers before and put stuff on the on the table and said hey we made this on a swiss lathe and they're like no you didn't and we're like no we did and then wow okay now they want to talk to us you know what i mean sure so another you know maybe misconception uh, is is that you have to send small metal components overseas to to be price competitive how are you able to do this uh in the U.S. and and still be uh, uh, pretty competitive. It's it's that exact automation thing. So a lot of these small components, particularly, are not very are not easily automated. They're not easily cut out of bar stock on automated machines like Swiss lathes. What we're doing is we're creating the tooling and the fixturing and the programming necessary to make it possible to do that. So the way we're able to be price competitive is because we can run these parts in on a lights out capacity 24 hours a day with zero operator intervention. There's uh, parts that we've done in the past where we actually, our, our customer was looking to uh, have this part cast and, uh, but they, they really wanted it to, you know, hit the market soon. And they were looking at like a nine month lead time before they can even get, you know, the first batch of castings off. And so they came to us to uh, to to make the part uh, just out of bar stock, um, and we ended up actually making the part out of bar stock within two weeks for less money than it was going to cost for them to uh, get yeah, them cast. cast. Let alone the cast cost of the uh, the fixturing and tooling required to do the casting. That's a, a good return on investment and a quick return on investment, it sounds like. Right, and you're pretty transparent as far as uh, publishing prices uh, in your catalog. I would imagine you'd get some, some good reaction from that. Yeah, we like to call it the shock and awe because uh, I think that, especially in the supplier world, everybody always says they're the best or they're the cheapest or they're different, and we, we, we just want to prove it right off the bat. And so we list the pricing of some of our most commonly purchased components because we know they're extremely competitive and we want people to know what they can expect when they ask for a custom quote because it's going to be in line with what you're seeing there. And, you know, Grace, with your experience on the, on the sales side, and I know you've uh, sold in uh, many different uh, types of, of verticals, you know, how do what what does that bring to to the company and how you interact with with customers? Yeah, I think that the best value I've brought to Darmac is my complete fear of asking. I it, I I'm contacting every relevant manufacturer that I think could utilize this information. Our our goal truly is to to really make an impact on manufacturing in America because there just isn't any reason why every manufacturer couldn't be taking these steps. Um, it's just that this industry's kind of been stagnant for a little while. And then now everyone's trying to, to jump into automation and not really seeing that there's kind of this gap that oh, so many manufacturers are falling into. Um, and I just really feel like you know, I have no fear. My husband always jokes, if I had Bill Gates' phone number, I, I would call him. Zero hesitation. <laughs> yeah, it takes it takes a, a person that uh, doesn't have any fear and is willing to uh, to ask for for what needs to be do done to, to accomplish things. I mean, I've been calling manufacturers and just straight up asking them what they're paying for certain components or just telling them what we charge. And you'd be shocked at the response. I mean, we've We've managed to secure some business with some really large manufacturers already. So being it that you've taken on quite a bit of work, uh, you know, what what is your growth plans? You know, what are what areas are you targeting for near term, the, the, the rest of 24 and beyond? Yeah, so we are in a in growth mode, 100 percent growth mode, and we're we're absolutely ready for that. We took on some private investors over the summer and we're build we built out our corporate infrastructure to be able to support rapid growth. Uh, we've made partnerships with other machine shops who are willing to uh, accommodate our programming and our pricing so that we can easily outgrow the capabilities of our shop while still continuing to take orders and grow our client base. Um, we've also partnered with several state organizations uh, for job creation. 
So we're working with uh, the state of Iowa right now to hire uh, people from underserved communities and provide on the job training. Um, and we have every intention of being a major employer and major player in the manufacturing scene inside of 10 years. And you also uh, provide some of these services to your customers as far as uh, sales training and uh, marketing or? Yes. And that that's kind of like the last little piece of it, because, you know, my experience in sales has shown me that the manufacturing industry and the firearms industry in particular are there are no sales training programs that are really geared to them. There's there's really no sales training uh, programs or leadership training programs that are specifically targeted for manufacturing sales. And I think there's a huge gap in that. And I think that I can be effective. So we're offering that as well. Obviously, you know, contract manufacturing has been around for a long time. And it kind of it goes back and forth between companies wanting to do something in-house versus outsourcing and then you know, there may be certain instances where it makes sense to do one one or the other. Are are you finding that there is sort of a, a sweet spot that you're you're looking at in terms of uh, you know when it makes sense to to be a contract manufacturer? Yeah, you know, that's actually exactly why we do what we do because I feel like we're in this unique position to go into a manufacturer and say we can help you figure out the best solution for what you're trying to accomplish, whether that means you outsource it to us or we rate the program, design the tooling, come program your machine, teach your operators how to run it. We call it turnkeys that actually open doors. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I really do think that that is a part of the service that we can provide is helping manufacturers to make that decision in an informed uh, manner. Well, the greats in town, thanks for joining us to, uh, today. Uh, great insight, very informative, and we appreciate you taking the time to talk. If listeners want to learn more about uh, Darmok and designs and some of your capabilities, where should they go? Yeah, they should feel free to visit our website at www.darmokdesigns.com. They can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Sounds good. And to learn more about the latest manufacturing trends and hear more podcasts, visit us at advancedmanufacturing.org.